Good morning. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is general questions. I would like to get in as many people as possible and short and succinct questions and responses would be appreciated. And at question number one, I call Jamie Halcrow-Johnston. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether its draft budget will enable local authorities to deliver a consistent level of core services. Minister Tom Arthur. Well, reductions to UK government funding have reduced the overall Scottish budget for 2022-23 by 5.2 per cent in real terms. The Scottish Government has increased local government funding for day-to-day -day services such as schools and social care by £975.7 million in 2022-23, a real-term increase of 6%. This funding, including the extra £120 million added at Stage 2 of the Budget Bill, will enable local authorities to, del to deliver their core services supporting communities across the country. Jamie Halker-Johnston. I uh, thank the Minister for that answer. However, at a time when public services, including those provided by councils, have been stretched to breaking point, the SNP Greens' cuts to council budgets is nothing short of an insult. Trumpeting an additional £120 million after cutting £371 million requires some brass neck from the Minister. It is still a cut. So what will the Minister tell constituents across my region and across Scotland, who now risk seeing that, that cut reflected in their vital local services being scaled back and their council tax bills going up. Minister. Well, I, I thank the member for his supplementary question. I want to be clear I recognise the outstanding and vital work that local authorities do across Scotland. But if anyone's got a brass neck, it's a member because it's his party in government that Westminster has cut the Scottish budget by 5.2% and has refused to engage constructively in this budget process over the past two months. The reality is we have a reduced budget and we have given a fair settlement to local government with a real terms increase in the local government settlement. And I hope perhaps in future budgets the Conservatives may want to engage in a more mature and considered fashion, where instead of just calling for funding increases, we state clearly where that funding should come from. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. The leader of Orkney Islands Council last week announced he was withdrawing from COSLA, denouncing the settlement from the Scottish Government as the worst of any local authority. Does the Minister believe that such treatment of Orkney Islands Council uh, reflects a government committed to island proofing and supporting our island communities? Minister. Well, as the member will appreciate, the uh, distribution of funding through the needs based formula is a, is, is a process that is taken in conjunction with COSLA. Our deliberations in this Parliament are with regards to the overall local government funding settlement. And as I said before, there has been a real terms increase for that settlement. And I would again make the point, if members wish to see in future budgets more money for one budget line, then they have to identify the corresponding budget line where there should be a reduction. Question number two, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans to introduce trials for a four-day working week. Minister Richard Lockhead. We are committed to establishing a £10 million fund to allow companies to pilot and explore the costs and benefits of moving to a shorter four-day working week. And we are in the early stages of developing this pilot and are committed to developing a comprehensive design for the pilot over the next year supported by an initial £500,000 of funding. Our work will be informed by experience drawn from similar projects in other countries and, of course, elsewhere in the UK. Rona Mackay. Thank the Minister for that answer. Um, the pandemic can be used as an impetus to change the dynamic of work for the better. What work is the Scottish Government undertaking to ensure workers' voices and rights are at the heart of any upcoming four-day week trials across the country? Minister. Well, the member is right. The pandemic has served to intensify interest in and support for more flexible working practices. And we have already seen the possibilities and positives of adopting alternative working practices for a better and more inclusive balance between work and people's personal lives. Ministers have, have met and continue to regularly meet with trade unions to ensure that workers' voices and rights are at the heart of these pilots. And that will be a guiding principle as we move forward. Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer. 
to ask the Scottish Government for its reaction to the recent report by Autonomy that even under worst-case uh, scenario, its research suggests that a four-day working week would be affordable for most businesses once the initial phase of the COVID-19 pandemic has passed. Minister. Uh, yes, I have looked at the findings of that report, which I think was around uh, a year ago, and it does indeed say that the, under the best case scenario, a reduction in hours would be entirely offset by increases in productivity and price increases uh, as well. Of course, there was also worst case scenarios we have to pay attention to, uh, and they found a number of issues around perhaps cash flow for, for some companies uh, as well. So that's why the pilots will be so valuable, so we can learn the lessons in the Scottish context of how to take this forward. Question number three, Christine Graham. Thank you, officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many instances of failure to comply with the 20 mile an hour uh, speed limit in Midlothian, South Tweedale and Lauderdale have been recorded since its introduction, including how many fines were subsequently issued as part of the enforcement of 20 mile an hour speed limits. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Yeah, the information requested is not held by the Scottish Government. Police Scotland are responsible for the enforcement of speed limits. Christine Graham. Well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the response. So my next port of call is obviously Police Scotland. Uh, so a village in the border through which the A7 passes has had long-standing issues with speeding by both cars and commercial vehicles. Anxiety increased because the pavements are narrow and can't be widened. Residents in the local community council thought the 20 mile an hour speed limit would have a major impact on speeding, but breaches, I'm told, are frequent. What can the community do beyond contacting Police Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, well, I would say that the Scottish Government Good Practice Guide on 20 mile an hour speed restrictions suggests that any changes should be monitored and where compliance levels are not at an acceptable level, consideration should be given to the addition of traffic calming measures or, in some cases, reverting to a 30 mile, uh, mile per hour limit if necessary. But these things are the result of a dialogue between a uh, number of partners, primarily between the Council and, in the members' case, the Councils involved and Police Scotland. Uh, and I know that the 20 mile roads in Midlothian, South Tweedale and Lauderdale, Lauderdale are a mix of local roads uh, and therefore under the responsibility of local councils, although also trunk roads. I know that's a concern of the members. Some speed surveys have been undertaken by the Borders Council, including on the trunk roads, which are of concern to the member. And I would suggest if she wants to have further discussion both with the local authorities and with the police, I'm happy to pass that message on and add my support to the further dialogue which she's seeking. Craig Hoy. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the Minister aware that new data reveals there are 59 fewer local police officers in Lothian and the Borders compared to the period before the creation of Police Scotland? And does the Minister share my concern that these savage SNP cuts to frontline policing are under undermining efforts to issue fines, combat speeding and could be putting lives at risk in Stow across the Borders and the wider south of Scotland region? Um, I'm not wholly convinced that that referred to the substantive question. Cabinet Secretary, if you'd like to answer very briefly. Uh, I will do just to say that, of course, what the member neglects to mention, we have around 50 per cent more police officers per capita in Scotland yeah, yeah. than we do in England and Wales. And it's his government that's cut the funding for this. It's his government that cut 20,000 police officers in England and Wales, so we'll take no lessons from the Tories on proper police funding. Yeah. Question number four, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions ministers have had with the outdoor education sector since December 2021. Minister Claire Hawhey. I met with representatives from the outdoor education sector on the 9th of November. The meeting was also attended by Councillor McCabe, COSLA's Children and Young People spokesperson. Since that meeting, Scottish Government officials have held a series of meetings and further discussions with the sector. And, Presiding Officer, I am pleased to confirm today that an additional £2 million in support funding will be provided to the sector. Liz Smith. Uh, can I warmly welcome that uh, £2 million commitment from the Scottish Government? I think it is absolutely essential uh, that that money is there to safeguard our outdoor education centres. Could I also, however, ask the uh, Minister, if she could comment on the article by Martin Davidson from the Outward Bound Trust in the Scotsman today to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to address the inequalities in access to outdoor education for residentials for many children across Scotland. Minister. I thank Liz Smith for her welcome of the additional funding um, and also for her question. So she will be aware that in the 2021-22 PFG we committed to providing financial support to low-income families, ensuring that all children can participate 
and curriculum related trips and activities, not only trips to residential centres, but also all forms of school trips which have a curriculum related purpose. And the programme for government further makes a commitment to ensure that secondary school pupils will be supported to go on at least one optional residential centre trip during their time at school. Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister provide an update on the Scottish Government's actions to expand outdoor learning, particularly for children from disadvantaged backgrounds? And how will she work with organisations like Outlet Play Resources to achieve this? Minister. So our vision is that all children and young people are participating in a range of progressive and creative outdoor learning experiences. As Colette Stevenson indicates, there are a range of commitments within the programme for government relating to outdoor learning and school trips. During the course of this year, the government will engage with key partners in local government and in the outdoor learning sector to progress these commitments. And this work will build on our COVID-19 Outdoor Education Recovery Fund, which provided an additional £500,000 to outdoor learning experiences last year, reaching many pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds. And a report from last year's funding programme will be published soon. Question number five, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve the services available to people with a gambling addiction. Minister Marie Todd. We share the concerns expressed by many around the impact of gambling-related harms in Scotland, and we recognise that gambling can have disastrous consequences. We agree with the view of our stakeholders that a public health approach is needed to tackle these harms and to improve in treatment services. We are working with Public Health Scotland and third sector stakeholders to develop an understanding of the scale of the problem in our communities. We are assessing person-centred and localised treatment options, recognising that there is not a one-size-fits-all solution. And we welcome the review of the Gambling Act 2005 and further hope to see greater regulation and control of the gambling industry in the coming White Paper to prevent gambling-related harms in Scotland. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that helpful and comprehensive answer. As we know, problem gambling is highly disruptive to sufferers and their families. Gambler Aware Research found that one in five problem gamblers spent more on the habit during lockdown, with young people particularly likely to increase their gambling. Will the Minister therefore consider establishing or supporting the establishment of a residential clinic specifically for gambling addicts in Scotland? Minister. I thank the member for this question. Gambling-related harms though, are complicated in origin and they affect a whole range of people, not just those experiencing the most significant level of problem gambling for which residential clinics may be of most use. So there isn't just one single approach that will solve the issues related to gambling-related harms and the introduction of a residential clinic can't be um, the only approach taken. As I said in my earlier answer, we are very keen to work with the third sector and those with lived experience to understand the person-centred treatment options for those experiencing gambling-related harms and to consider localised approaches. Question number six, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support local authorities in dealing with instances of bullying in schools. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Whenever it arises. In 2017, we published updated anti bullying guidance for all adults working with children and young people. In 2019, we introduced a uniform approach to recording and monitoring incidents of bullying in schools and published guidance on this. To support local authorities, schools, and all those working with children and young people to build confidence and capacity. To address bullying effectively, we have established and fully funded Respect Me, Scotland's anti-bullying service. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. In the last few weeks, I have been dealing with four constituent queries relating to significant alleged bullying in schools, three in secondary schools and one in a primary school. In all cases, the child who has experienced bullying has moved to another school and is doing well. However, what more can be done to help local authorities educate those involved in bullying type behaviours and support victims so that it is not always they who have to move away to escape the abuse? Cabinet Secretary. Well, this must have been an exceptionally difficult time for Mr McGregor's constituents, particularly the young people involved in this. 
As I said in my original answer, our focus is very much on prevention and early intervention, environments that engage with young people, promote respect, celebrate difference and encourage positive relationships and behaviour are key in supporting our young people. There are a range of strategies which schools use to improve relationships and behaviour and support in these approaches is provided by Education Scotland, as well as, of course, through the relevant local authority. As I mentioned, the Respect Me provides support to all adults working with young people to give them practical skills and confidence to deal with bullying behaviour appropriately. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for those answers, which you consider extending the 2019 records so that identification of bullying using cyber methods, be it mobile phones or laptops, can be identified and centrally collated? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I thank the member for that, um, for that question. I would be more than happy to follow up with um, him directly with this in further detail. We are, of course, uh, very aware that as society changes, then, of course, our bullying strategies need to make sure that they are up to date and relevant to the challenges that our young people um, are facing. Uh, so, as I said, I would be very happy to meet with the member to discuss his particular concerns on this and to go into this in further detail. Question number seven, Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason the ten pound Christmas payment will continue to be paid by DWP to recipients of disability allow living allowance and personal independence payment once the benefits are fully devolved. Minister Ben McPherson. President Officer, the reason is because the payment Mr Balfour refers to is a reserve benefit and is not devolved to the Scottish Parliament. The £10 Christmas payment is a UK government payment that is paid to people in receipt of various benefits, including disability benefits and low-income benefits, such as pension credit. As Mr Balfour is aware, we have worked with the UK government to ensure access to passported reserve benefits, such as the Christmas bonus payment, as well as other entitlements for people receiving the Scottish Government's child disability payment and adult disability payment. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, the issue is from time on now, we're going to still have two lists. Every year, the agency are going to have to pass that information on to DWP. So can I ask the Minister, has he had discussions with DWP about devolving this power to the new agency to save this administrative cost? Minister. The Scottish Government engages in a regular dialogue with the Department for Work and Pensions with regard to data transfer and sharing of relevant information across the delivery of our devolved benefit programme. If Mr Balfour is now arguing for more social security powers to come to the Scottish Parliament, then I welcome that because we have seen on the evidence of delivery so far that both our agency, Social Security Scotland, and this government are delivering social security in a way that is a human rights-based approach that is based in dignity, fairness and respect. We are delivering well and with more powers we could do even more. Eleanor Whittam. Given that the £10 Christmas payment is a reserved benefit, does the Minister agree that Jeremy Balfour might like to join me and others in calling for the full powers over Social Security to be devolved to this Parliament? Minister. Indeed, as I have already stated, the delivery of devolved Social Security to date is something all of this Parliament should uh, be proud of. We set up Social Security Scotland from scratch and it's developing, growing and strengthening each day. And we're about to deliver our 12th benefit, uh, seven of which are new, of course, including the remarkably important Scottish Child Payment, which, of course, has been uh, strongly welcomed by stakeholders and families. And importantly, presiding officer, we are making a really meaningful difference for thousands of households, uh, spending £361 million extra above uh, the fiscal framework and giving extra help. And if we compare this to DWP, who, of course, uh, withdrew £20 a week from family budgets, who, of course, have been found to have wasted billions of pounds worth, £8.3 billion in PPE contracts uh, and also uh, £4.3 billion in fraud write-off. So uh, we are delivering well, we are de delivering proficiently, uh, and with more powers, we will be able to make an even bigger difference for thousands of families. So I, along with many, many others in Scotland, look forward to the days coming soon when we will gain and utilise more powers Thank you, uh, to make an even bigger Thank difference you, together. That concludes general questions. The